yeah. Okay, are you guys ready for this? Are you guys ready for God Valley? Are you guys ready for the biggest slobber knocker this side of the new world? Well, we're gonna have to wait a little bit longer. Maybe five chapters, maybe 50, maybe 200, who knows? Because we are cutting away from rocks in God Valley, and we are focusing on the humble life of Bartholomew Kuma. Who is ready for this? Oh yeah! Ooh, Kuma's gonna be a pastor! He's gonna be a kind and benevolent man, and he's gonna reject the pain from all the old people living in his village. Are you guys ready for this? One Piece Chapter 1097 review titled, Ginny. I have, you can't see it, but I have this really fancy giant touchpad next to me I've upgraded because normally whenever I do these, I have like a little uh, little table to my left with my laptop on it. And so, you know, it's kind of far away. I have to kind of like kneel down and like, you know, look at the panel to make sure. But now I have this giant like 27 inch like TV tablet thing next to me and I could just like scroll through the whole chapter like that. So I'm, I'm upgrading. Okay, so uh, cover page. This this week. It is a fan request, but I don't think it's the fan request that the fan really intended. Uh, the request was simply, uh, hey Oda Sensei, can you draw Kuma catching fish at the river? Because Bartholomew Kuma, his name means bear, so bears, you know, will catch, you know, fish at the river. So the way that uh, Oda actually drew this, though, because Kuma is, like, very involved in the story right now, he actually draws Kuma as well as Ginny catching the fish. Fish. So Kuma's in the water using his pawpaw fruit to like pop the fish out of the river and just appear over and like Ginny grabs them and she's like gonna grill them up. So that's actually really cool. Also, we see the two kids that last chapter Kuma, you know, he was, uh, they were picking on him. They were like throwing rocks at him. Ginny beat them up and then he used his uh, paw powers to uh, remove the pain, okay? So something I missed was those two kids are actually going to grow up to be members of Bonnie's crew. The ones that we see at the Sabaody Archipelago. The one dude that has like, uh, you know, the little hat and then the other dude that has kind of like a mohawk sort of thing going on. They eventually will be captured by a kainu. Uh, what happened there is we don't know the whole story, but we know Bonnie was captured by Blackbeard shortly after she entered the New World. And then a kainu showed up, Blackbeard skipped out, and then a kainu was just there like, oh, Bonnie, it's a good thing we caught you. Now, we don't know exactly how she escaped. I'm assuming it was a combination of not just her powers, uh, which, by the way, SBS 107, we finally know the name of Bonnie's devil fruit. It's the Toshi Toshi no Me. It just means the age, age fruit or the year, year fruit. Something that everybody kind of expected. But yeah, I, I'll be doing an SBS video later this week. There wasn't really anything crazy in this one. Um, honestly, the uh, reveal of Bonnie's devil fruit might have been the biggest thing. But yeah, it's it's kind of like with kids fruit, you know, we didn't know about kids jiki jiki no me for the longest time And in fact, this is something very similar where Oda is like wait a second. I didn't reveal that yet Okay, here it is because like it, it's nothing surprising It's not like kids fruit was something we didn't expect. It's the magnet magnet fruit Bonnie's fruit is the age age fruit. It, it's like the common what most people expected it to be it was but yeah It's the Toshi Toshi no me. So anyway probably a combination of Bonnie Bonnie using her Toshi Toshi no Mi as well as her crew helping her escape and so she got away and so she was on her own for pretty much the entire time skip all the way up until now when she arrived at Egghead. We always saw her in the New World by herself just kind of getting by, you know, stealing food and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, it's actually really cool that those two kids that were like, I guess, became friends with Kuma and Ginny after that whole incident uh, would grow up and become uh, basically like, uh, kind of like Bonnie's guardians on her crew, just like making sure sure she's okay because she's Kuma's daughter, okay? That's actually kind of neat. I like that. So we are beginning the chapter eight years after the God Valley incident. So this is 30 years ago. Kuma is 17 and Ginny is 21. Uh, there was a little bit of a mistranslation. Some of the translations said that Ginny was actually four years, uh, like she was like four years old in the last chapter, which would have been crazy because at age four, she would have mastered like telecommunications and like spy networks. You know, no, she, she was 13. She's four years older than Kuma, okay? Uh, which is still kind of crazy when you think about the whole God Valley incident was caused uh, when like a girl just like made a phone call to various pirates and just like hey um, the Marines took a bunch of really rare devil fruits from you pirates they're here on God Valley 
click, and then giant war. So, like, there it is. So, anyway, Kuma has set himself up now at age 17 as the pastor at the church. Uh, that was the church, by the way, that his father, Clap, and his mother had, I guess, preached at. Okay, so it was Kuma's home. Okay, so when they returned to the Sorbet Kingdom after God Valley, Kuma obviously would go back to his, you know, childhood home, but obviously his parents are gone. His dad is dead. His mother passed away at Marijua, but the church was just kind of left empty and abandoned, and uh, when Kuma returned with Ivankov and Ginny, Ivankov ended up leaving, but Ginny and Kuma stayed behind, and they repaired the church a little bit, and Kuma, at age 17 now, is the humble pastor, which makes sense, because every time we see Kuma in the present, he's always carrying around a Bible. Um, I, I questioned last time, kind of jokingly, uh, what religion do they, do they practice? You know, like, which god do they worship? And I made a joke about, like, you know, is Jesus in the One Piece world? Like, well, maybe Jesus was Joy Boy, who knows? But then I'm like, wait a minute, no! they would just probably worship Nika, right? They would probably just worship the sun god. It's like, it's right there. It's so obvious. Clap was obviously, and it was like, oh, don't worry, Kuma. All you gotta do is dance, you know? And just like, so yeah, that's obviously, if, if they didn't worship before, like, th this is the god in Kuma's perspective. The god that Kuma would worship and that he would, like, get down on his knees and pray to like this would probably be the sun god. The god that represents freedom and hope to all of those that are suffering and that are enslaved in this world um, and bring smiles to everybody's face, that would be the God that he would worship. Absolutely, right? So I'm not really sure if like, you know, there, there's like, I, I mean, there is a Bible. There, there's a Bible that exists. So that must be like the Bible of the sun god, which is now making me really question so many things in this world. Like what is, did Kuma write the Bible? Was there a sun god religion? Like beforehand, it was always talked about that like the sun god, Nika, was always just kind of a being that the slaves would just kind of tell stories about in order to make it better for themselves to like give them hope that they could escape someday. So. So I guess, yeah, that is how a lot of religions begin, but in terms of, like, scripture, like, actually written text and, like, you know, codex and to tomes and stuff like that, um, you know, like, does that exist or did Kuma have to write that? I'm, j I'm just interested in that. There's a lot of, lot of questions that are being brought about in the theological argument here, you know what I mean? Of, like, the, the sun god Nikaism or, or something like that, you know? Okay. Well, anyway, Kuma is here, and uh, 30 years ago, by the way, this would have been the same year that, um, actually the same year Garp fought Xin Zhao. So while Kuma is a humble pastor, you know, Garp is punching Xin Zhao's, you know, nail head down into a stump. And uh, also it was the same year that uh, Odin joined Whitebeard. Uh, Odin went out to sea and joined Whitebeard. But this is just the South Blue, humble little village. The old folks are coming into the church every Sunday, and they're like, oh, Kuma, yes, when your father preached here, I came every Sunday. Yes, I did. I'm a good worshiper of the sun god. But but then he disappeared, and I was a little worried, but then you came back, and oh, Clap raised a very, very good son, and so could you help me with my, my hip problems, you know? So Kuma, being very nice, is using his hands of liberation, his hands of freedom and healing, to heal all of the uh, poor old people that are living in the Sorbet Kingdom. So they come to him. It seems mostly the uh, the congregation is made up of, of old folks, uh, you know, so the, there's a little village nearby, and so they'll come in every Sunday, and, and it's like, oh, my hip, oh, my back, oh, my cataracts. I wonder what the limit is to what Kuma can really reject from people, right? Because he mentions to them later, um, oh my god, this thing is so cool. I'll take away any light pain or sickness. So what's the, uh, what's the upper extent of that? You know, I'm just curious. It's just like, if, okay, let's say cataracts, because cataracts are a thing that, like, it's not really, I mean, it is a disease, but it, like, it forms around your eyes and makes it difficult to see. So could Kuma just push and the ah! oh my cataracts are gone. I can see again. All the glory of well, easy come, easy go. So um, they talk to him though, and they're like, "Hey Kuma, can you do this on the weekdays? Because apparently he only does this particular service. Uh, I, I guess there's actually a mass, like there's a congregation that comes in and he, you know, speaks the word of the sun god and everything like that. And then after the service, it's just like now all of my children that would wish to be healed and be alleviated with the the healing paw hands, please approach the um, um oh god, I, uh, the, please approach the 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 
banister. I, I don't know. I don't know. He's like, whatever. Come up here to the altar. The altar. That's it. The altar. Yeah. Come up to the altar. Okay. And so he only does this on Sundays, though. So they're like, can you do this? Can you open this up on the weekend, please? And to that point, Ginny then bursts in. So Ginny bursts in. She's 21 at this point. And uh, she kind of chastises the congregation. She's like, no, Kuma cannot do this any other day. He can only do it today because you guys are a bunch of freeloaders that don't even pay him for this. All right. The collection plate over there has been dry as a bone for a month. <laughs> okay. So they're like, she's like yelling at these old people and just like, no, Kuma does enough for all of you. You should be grateful, damn it. And they all kind of talk about like how Ginny is so stingy and she's beautiful, but she has such a like an abrasive, very rough personality. Although they also bring up that, uh, you know, every like, like every young suitor in town is also, you know, you know, confessing their love to her because of that reason. You know, she's she's like the domineering older sister type. In fact, she's wearing like a tank top that literally just says sister across it. So that's that. She mentions, you know, this isn't some kind of like a relief camp or, or hospital or anything like that. This is a church. You know, you come here to worship and you should be thankful Kuma is even, you know, doing this service to you and like helping you remove your pain and everything like that, right? So, um, they, 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 they're like, you know, Ginny's yelling at them, but they're taking it in good stride. I guess this is a pretty common occurrence. So they're just like, oh, okay, Ginny. Oh my goodness. You know, maybe you should, you know, there's a lot of men in town that would love to marry you. Maybe your personality is just, you know, I don't know. That's what the young people are into these days. <laughs> you know, right? Okay. Uh, but they also mentioned that, oh, we're, we're so happy just to see Kuma, like just going to church and seeing Kuma's like smile face gives everybody hope and it kind of alleviates their tension and everything like that. Of course, the healing hands is a bonus, but Kuma is like, oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you, everybody. Oh, gee shucks. This is just such a good time. So before shit really hits the fan, what we're going to see later uh, in the chapter, because we're going to time jump a lot in this one, at the very least, you know, growing up at this phase in Kuma's life, it was pretty happy. It was pretty happy. Him living in the church with Ginny and having having the, just the, the old folks from the village. I'm sure they bring them pie every now and then. Like, oh, Kuma, I made you my special apple pie. Aw, oh, thank you, old lady uh, uh, Jenkins. Thank you, old lady Jenkins. Tell your husband I said hello. Oh, I will, of course, yes. You know, it's just like, it, it, it's nice. It's, it's very wholesome. It's a wholesome, nice time for Kuma and Ginny, all right? Don't take that away from him. That, that's Oda's job. That is Oda's job to take that away from him, okay? All right. So, um, they're talking now a little bit about the politics of the islands. So, uh, because of the celestial you know, dragons and their heavenly tribute, because the Sorbet Kingdom is an allied nation of the world government, they have to pay the tribute. Well, because of that, that's the reason they don't have really any money to give to Kuma. That's the reason the collection plate's a little dry. Because it's like, you know, they have to take all the little money they have left and put it in the collection, the tax collection, to go to the Tenrabito, to go to Marijua, right? Okay, so they're talking about that. They're they're having a hard time surviving just on their own. However, they're also mentioning that there is a new king of the Sorbet Kingdom now. This is King Bekori, uh, B-E-K-O-R-I, all right? And you see an image of him and, uh, he doesn't look like a nice guy. He looks like a pretty big hard ass. He just looks like the, oh yes, I am King Bakuri of the Sorbet Kingdom. My first edict, siphon off all of the old people because they suck. And then we're going to draw all the money from them. And then prepare my dinner, my magnificent feast. He's that kind of dipshit. So, you know, he's that kind of typical one piece dipshit. So we'll, we'll see where that goes. In fact, we, we, we can already assume where that's going to go. Okay. So uh, he's like, he demands man sick people like us pay the heavenly tribute ah uh, he's like oh yeah the prison is horrible too oh uh, my husband starved to death in there it's like oh god yeah so this is this is pretty bad and it's also probably like the one beacon of hope that these people have in their life to go to kuma's church every sunday and hear the story about nika and how he's going to bring happiness and smiles to the world probably one of the few things in these old folks life that are really making it through the day you know what i mean 
So, uh, now, now Ginny's not mean to that. Ginny's not going to be like, I don't care about your husband. Get out of here. You know, Ginny like sits there and she's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. That, that really does suck. The corruption that's going on here. And they saw this firsthand. I mean, Ginny and Kuma were both slaves at Marijua, even after getting away from Marijua and escaping back to their homeland. Uh, well, I guess Kuma's homeland. Ginny's not from here, but you know, Kuma's homeland, even here in the South Blue, which is far from the ivory towers of Marijua and far, it's on the other side of the planet from God Valley, um, despite that, this corruption still persists. These corrupt kings that are bleeding their citizens dry, locking them up in the dungeons, just like Arlong locked up Belamir. Remember that? Belamir is still locked in the dungeons, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my goodness, it's bad. We see an image of Bakori in his castle, and uh, he's talking to the celestial dragons via a Den Den Mushi, and now he's like super, like, he's like, oh, hello there, celestial dragons. I am King Bakori. Oh, don't worry. I will make sure I get you the biggest cele celestial tribute that you've ever seen in your life. Absolutely. You can count on me, Bakori. Anyway, so for the next reverie, I was wondering if I could get a seat. No? Okay, that's okay. I will be fine with that. Tell you what, I will give you even more next year. That's the kind of guy Bakori is. And I'm sure that's the kind of guy and uh, girl that a lot of kings and queens of the One Piece worlds really are. Um, at the end of the day, it's like, okay, uh, I am the king. Well, not really, because you got to answer to the Ten Rubito, okay? So it's either you got one or two choices here. Choice number one, you can decide to stay by your citizens in your country. This is kind of like, like what Cobra and Riku Dold the Third did. You know, they were kings of their people. They cared about their people. They were kind and generous kings, okay? Then you could either be that or you could be the king that's like, all right, screw the population, I am going to side with the Tenorubito because they're the ones I want to get in good graces with because they're the ones that actually rule the world, okay? And so there are these two types of royalty, two types of rulers that exist in the One Piece world, broadly speaking, of course. Some islands don't even have kings and queens, like Water 7. I always assumed Water 7 was connected to the world government. It was allied with it, but Water 7 didn't have a king. They had, like, an elected official. They had Iceberg, who was a mayor. But in most of the kingdoms, they are kingdoms, right? So... Yeah, um, in the case with Cobra and Riku, yeah, they were definitely there for their people. In the case with this uh, this dude right here, this Bakori, as well as like uh, Seki, King Seki of Lelusia Kingdom. I uh, don't know where that is or even if it was a kingdom, but that's the place I'm thinking of right now. They were very cruel kings that did not care about their own citizens and only cared about like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. How much money? How much crops? How, many, how much resources can you produce? Okay, thank you. Give it to me. I'm giving it to the Celestial Dragons. Oh, yes, Celestial Dragons. I love you so much. Can I please join the Reverie? I can. Oh my god, this is great. Fantastic. You know, so that's that's the way that situation goes there. So all of the old folks, uh, they leave the church, they go back home, and then later that evening, uh, you see Kuma walking through the, uh, you know, the pews and everything like that in the uh, gathering hall of the church, and you just see a giant pain bubble. Uh, not quite as big as the one that, you know, Kuma rejected out of Luffy at Thriller Bark, but still a pretty sizable one, okay? It's bigger than Kuma himself, and Kuma's already a big guy, all right? So he approaches it, and he kind of has to, like, you know, just like... Whew, okay, uh, this one's kind of big this week, okay. <sighs> you know, and so he does that. He has to absorb all the pain into himself, right? And I'm reading this, and I'm looking at that, and I'm like, oh my god, Kuma, there, there has to be a better way. Are you tired of your pain bubbles taking on the, the force and strife of a hundred people at once? You know, try new pain off, you know, it's just, it's the new. He's like, no, but there has to be a better way, right? I was like, can't you just take the bubble and like store it in the basement or something? Like, or, or put it into an inanimate object? Like, take the pain bubble and throw it into a rock and the rock like shatters? Like, isn't there something you can do? Well, in the next panel, it actually gives us a new explanation on how Kuma's ability really works. And it adds like kind of a whole new dimension to this, right? So as Kuma is in the church, just, you know, yelling and screaming in agony and pain, you know, blood and stuff rupturing from his body, Ginny is in the next room and she's just crying. She's sitting there just like bawling her eyes out because this is a weekly occurrence. This is the reason Ginny came out when, when she got so pissed that all of the old people were like, oh, Kuma, could you please reject our pain every day of the week or during the weekdays? Maybe Wednesdays. I'm good for Wednesdays. That's why Ginny got so mad. It's just because he, they don't know the kind of pain and strife that Kuma has to go through every single week in order to reject all of their pain. Because as we find out, if 
I leave it be, if I leave the pain bubble be, they will eventually return back to their original users. Okay, the person that the pain was rejected from. Okay, so he could take individual pain bubbles and kind of congeal it together into a big bubble, but if left unattended, it'll just go back. And I guess he can't put the pain bubble into an inanimate object to have it shatter. Um, I mean, Kuma is a very kind person, so he would never do this. But like one way that you could do it, I guess, is you could grab a pirate or something that's just like, Yarg! I be Goldbeard the pirate! I'm gonna be the next Goldie Roger! I burned down this town! Yeah, okay, come over here, we need you to do something. Wait, what? Psha! <laughs> just like, all right, you're gonna hang out here in our church and just uh, do that for every week, right? Okay, that's cool. Obviously, Kuma would not do something that that cruel, um, so he would opt to take it on to himself. He's literally becoming a martyr. You can literally see this. He's literally taking on the physical pain of everybody in town. All right, all of the the raw pain of like a sore hip and and he's like, oh my goodness, my ankle. You know, it's like all that is rejected into Kuma. All right, and he's taking it like a champ. But Ginny is just, she's very upset about this. She does not want Kuma to be doing this week after week. You know, it causes you so much pain. And Kuma's like, Ugh, it can't be helped, Ginny. I want to help people, but my powers, you know, I can't just leave it be. Someone has to take on the pain to make it vanish for good. And, and of course, they're not going to tell the old folks about it because then they're going to feel guilty about doing this every single week, right? It's the idea that, like, nothing is free. There's Somebody has to pay the price. Somebody eventually has to feel this pain. Kuma's power only, like, basically removes the pain temporarily uh, to give, like, a little bit of a stopgap, but somebody eventually has to take it on, okay? Also, I want to say, this adds a whole new dimension to the nothing happens scene. If anybody out there was a little bit like, maybe not exactly confused, but you know, Kumo was there at Thriller Bark to eliminate the Straw Hats. That was his job. And then all of a sudden he's like, all right, tell you what, if, if Zoro, Pirate Hunter, if you go into this pain bubble and you take on all the pain from your captain, I'll let you go. Seems a little bit, now obviously we didn't know a lot about Kuma back then. At that point we didn't know about Kuma's backstory or the kind of guy, his connection to the Revolutionary Army. We didn't know any of that back then. So maybe some people back then would have been like, oh my god, Kuma is supposed to be a warlord tasked to eliminate the Straw Hats and he just lets them go just like that, just because Zoro took on some pain. That doesn't make any sense. Now that makes sense. That makes a million sense because Kuma is the kind of guy that would take on the pain of others so they could live on and they could live happy lives. And so Kuma gave that same option to Zoro and be like, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll let your captain live. I was sent here to kill him, but I will let him live. If you take on all the pain and suffering and exhaustion he had with his whole fight with Moria and Ors, and I'm sure Kuma was expecting, like, there's no way this guy's gonna do it. There is no way this swordsman dude is gonna do that. And and Zoro was like, all right, I'll do it. Just let, let's not do it around here. Let's do it somewhere quiet. Also very similar, uh, drawing parallels to this, where Kuma waits until it's nighttime and waits when no one's around, and then he absorbs the pain. So Kuma was like, oh my god, I can't believe this guy. I can't believe this swordsman would really do that. All right, let's go. And then he goes into the bubble, and then of course nothing happened, right? Kuma's respect for Zoro shot through the freaking ceiling. It was just like, hmm, all right, you know what? He did that for his captain, I'm gonna let him go. All right, so that's pretty cool. We have a nice little touching scene where Ginny, after Kuma absorbs all the pain, she's nursing him back to health. You know, he's in the bed, he's all beat up. He just like got, like, like got collectively beat up by like a hundred people at once, basically. And he's there and he's bleeding and he has a black eye and he has like ice on his head and just like, it'll be all right. And then they're like, okay, how about we eat food? We, we, st we still have some food here. And then Ginny's like, yeah, food, yeah. And so they have a nice meal together. So, you know, that's, that's, that's their life, okay? And that continues on for a number of years. We are now cutting to five years later. So 25 years ago in the, uh, the timeline of One Piece, this is when Kuma is 22 and Ginny is 26, all right? And this is the point where uh, Ginny decides to pop the question. So yeah, Ginny is very clearly Bonnie's mother. Um, it's at this point 25 years ago. So this was during, uh, this was actually during like when Roger found the One Piece actually. This was like during that moment there right after he found the One Piece um, and he 
was allotted as the King of the Pirates. And this is actually the year, I think, where, like, Roger was spending with Rouge, uh, where Ace was conceived, okay? So 25 years ago. This is also around the time Odin returns to Wano, and he sees, you know, Orochi and everything, and I think he starts, like, dancing in the streets. That's around this time. But yeah, we just have a moment where Ginny is now just, let's get married, Kuma, right here, right now. We're already in a church, and we don't even have to go anywhere. And Kuma's just like, uh, uh, Ginny, no, that's, let's, no, it's okay. It's like, oh, come on, why not? I'll make you happy. I will make you happy, Kuma, marry me right now. <laughs> just like, I will be the most amazing bride you have ever seen in your life. And just like, yeah, I, I know you would. It's just that, uh, and then he has a flashback to his mother and to his father and his father's last wish of just like, please don't, you know, uh, I, I am the one with buccaneer blood. Please do not harm my child. My wife doesn't have buccaneer blood. Please stop. And so that's why Kuma is hesitant to get married to Ginny and have a child because of what happened to his own parents. So Kuma is afraid that if they have a child, that child will have buccaneer blood and then the government will find out and it'll get leaked somehow just like it did with him, and then they'll show up and try to kill him, okay? So um, he's just like, yeah, I, I, I really don't want you to suffer. And then he kind of changes the topic. But here's the thing. Bonnie had to have been born at some point. Now, we don't actually see Bonnie in this chapter. We don't see Ginny holding a baby or anything like that. We don't have a scene where, you know, Ginny and Kuma and, and he's like they're cradling a baby Bonnie or anything like that. Now, Bonnie is, is listed to be like around 24 years old, and she was around when Vegapunk was um, establishing Egghead, and that was like 20 years ago, right? So if that's the case, then they, I'm thinking Oda just cuts over it. He doesn't just focus on that scene because we have a lot of stuff to cover in this chapter. But I think it was shortly after this moment where Ginny's like, come on, let's get married. Shortly after this, they do end up getting married. Kuma does relent, and then they do have a child. We just don't see it here. But by the end of the chapter, it's 14 years ago, and at that point, Ginny and Kuma aren't even together anymore. They're not separated or anything. They didn't get a divorce. It's just they're in separate parts of the world because they're members of the revolution at that point. I feel like, and it was listed that Bonnie was born in the South. She was born in the Sorbet Kingdom, so the only way that really works is like at this point, or maybe in the next flash forward we're going to get, but at some point Kuma and Ginny are going to leave the South to be in the Revolutionary Army, so Bonnie would have had to have been born before that, you know, obviously. Okay, well anyway... Kuma kind of changes the topic of the wedding to be like, uh, yeah, anyway, check out this news article about, uh, the Freedom Fighters. Uh, we, there's this guy named Dragon, and, uh, the government has finally issued a warrant for them. So, 25 years ago, right at the, right at the doorstep of, uh, the Great Pirate Era, right before Roger died, uh, is when the Revolutionary Army, or the Freedom Fighters, as they were known back then, uh, were beginning to make waves. In fact, it might have actually been a little bit before this, uh, because, um, um, you know, right before this would have been like when they started and gaining speed and gathering some followers. It's only now, 25 years ago, that the government is acknowledging them as criminals and as these these are revolutionaries, these are people that need to be stopped, okay? And so we see an image of Dragon in the paper. He does not have the tattoo across his face yet. Uh, he looks very much like he did when he met uh, Vegapunk at O'Hara. That's only three years away. Um, you know, 25 years ago was this flashback, 22 years ago was O'Hara. And so, yeah, Dragon is here and uh, he's just reading the paper and he's just like and Kuma's like wow Dragon is a really cool person I bet a lot of people look up to him I think I look up to him too he's really cool and he has a cool name Dragon my name is Bear I wish my name was Dragon and this is pretty neat. He, Dragon does have a cool name you know definitely uh, Garp knew what he was doing when he named Dragon and just like ah oh, my baby boy what am I gonna call you uh Stormbringer no uh you know Dreadnought Monkey D Dreadnought that's a cool one. Ah, no, that's too long. How about just Monkey D Dragon? Oh, yeah, that's cool, right? That's a little ironic, though, that Dragon would have been named Dragon, given that Garp doesn't like the Celestial Dragons, but we still have to, you know, Garp's wife might have been the one that named him. Who knows? We gotta figure out how that all works out, okay? Um, so people show up at the church to, like, give them food. Uh, it's the same dude with the hat and the mohawk that are eventually going to be, you know, members of Bonnie's crew. They're like, hey, we fought a bunch of, we got a bunch of fish! Um, and I think we actually get their name, the 
the dude that has the hat, uh, this guy right here, I guess his name is Gyo Gyo. Um, that, that would probably be his name. I don't think we ever got his name before that. And so there's a little bit of a comedy moment here. And, um, you know, we just kind of cut to the next flash forward. But I'm assuming, I'm assuming in that flash forward, the next one is 22 years ago. In between 25 years ago and 22 years ago, Kuma and Jenny got married and Bonnie was born. I'm assuming that's happening there because now we're cutting to 22 years ago. Uh, Kuma at this point would have been, uh, let me just double check. Man, this thing is so cool. Yeah, Kuma's 25. Um, but my God, this is awesome. I, I know you can't see it, but like, it's just like a giant tablet that I could just like move and like read the chapter that way. This, this is fancy, man. We're in the future right now. This is awesome. Okay. So this is where shit starts hitting the fan in the Sorbet Kingdom, okay? Um, the kingdom has effectively been cut in half by the king. So the king is just like, ah, all right, we need to, we need to maximize the amount of celestial dragon heavenly tribute here. Okay. Well, there's a bunch of these old people. Did you know there's just villages in the south of the island that are just covered with old people? Ew, it's disgusting. All right, here's what we're going to do. Here's the new battle plan for Sorbet. We're going to take the island and we're going to draw a massive line right in the center of it. The south is actually not even part of Sorbet Kingdom officially. That's just a lawless land. They can murder and kill and pirates and whatever. Not part of our country anymore. But meanwhile, the actual Sorbet Kingdom will be in the north part of the island. And that's the part we like to maximize the heavenly tributes, okay? Because the heavenly tribute citizens pay to the world government is decided by the value of the citizen. So I guess if you have... Uh, the, he, he mentions that old people who pay very little or, or do little still have to pay. So that's kind of like a drag down for like the celestial dragon tribute. Okay. So basically effectively, you know, corralling all of the old people into the Southern part of the Island and then just cutting it off and just be like, this is, this is not sorbet anymore. And then coming over here that will make the celestial tribute like easier to pay or like, you know, you're basically cutting your country in half. Okay. So we see a little map, a diagram of it. We see that the castle and the castle town is on the northern part of the island and then Kuma's church and the old people village is on the southern part of the island okay and uh, we even see one of the members of the army is like approaching the king and it's just like my king um this policy is kind of messed up dude and it's like oh it doesn't matter eventually they'll understand their place you know it is yeah so yeah this guy's an asshole right don't, don't worry, he'll get murdered in a moment. Uh, don't, don't worry, Dragon and Ivankov will come over here in a moment and kill the shit out of him. Don't worry, it's, it's gonna happen. So Kuma is in town and he hears the injustice of this, so he immediately barges into town and confronts the, um, the army. And he's like, you know, he's like, what are you doing? You can't, you can't do this. You can't just turn half the island into a freaking lawless land. And then, um, and you know, the, um, the army is just like, oh, it's the pastor. It's Kuma from the southern part of the island. What are you doing here? And he's just like, it is like, I, I, I can't let you do this. Is it already, is that a fight? Are you fighting us? Are you fighting the army? I guess I am. And so Kuma fights against the army and is summarily, you know, I guess he's just overwhelmed because Kuma is strong. Eventually Kuma would get overwhelmed if there's like, you know, 5,000 people fighting him. You know, eventually he would get, you know, the shit kicked out of him and then drawn into the prison. So they all get thrown into the prison on the island. Uh, Kuma is there. Ginny is there. Because they also, after Kuma got arrested, Ginny tried to br get him back. And so she got beat up and she got arrested. Gyogyo is also there. The Mohawk guy is also there. And a bunch of other people that I, I think will eventually become members of Bonnie's crew, right? Once again, Bonnie is not mentioned at this point. Okay, so but this is 22 years ago. This is during when um, Ohara happens. Yeah, so the Ohara incident is occurring same year as this. So now we get a really cool double page spread where Kuma is now really angry. Like, you see the veins beginning to pop. He has his hat at this point, his trademark Kuma hat, and he's just like, I cannot believe our kingdom would become like this. You know, we need to stop this by any means necessary before it gets out of hand. Um, and Ginny is just like, well, the king only cares about pleasing the nobles, pleasing the world government, the Tenerubito, and does not care about the citizens or anything else. And then that is when a giant explosion happens, and then Dragon and Ivankov and the revolutionaries, or rather the freedom fighters, Fighters make their appearance. They barge into the town. Dragon is basically just like, you know, 
I think the king is like, oh no, king, you must get out of here, please leave. And then Dragon's like, do you think we're gonna let that son of a bitch leave? <laughs> you think that's on the table right now? Dragon comes in and I'm uh, pretty sure the king is murdered by Dragon in cold blood. Like that is, that, that is pretty much the implication here, okay? But anyway, yeah, the kingdom is, we're, we're flashing forward a little bit here. The revolution happens very quickly. And just like Dragon and Ivankov and the revolutionaries burst in and then we just see that the town is just like applauding and he's like, yeah, we're free. Hey, woo! It got a little bit, it got kind of close to that. It's mentioned later that the, this is a very common policy that the Tenerabito spread in the world. Like, I could see them having meetings at the Reverie, the Tenerabito are like, so if you guys are having problems paying your celestial tribute, your heavenly tribute, um, think about maybe quartering off part of your island as a lawless zone? That's one option to do it. Like, I can imagine the Tender Bejo have this giant PowerPoint presentation, right? And they're just like, okay, everybody, listen up. I'm hearing a lot of people are having problems paying their heavenly tribute this year. So we came up with a handy little PowerPoint uh, that allows you to do it. So uh, number one, uh, make your citizens work more. It's, it's pretty simple. You know, 12-hour work days. Let's go to 20-hour work days. That's a good way to do it. Uh, you know, quarter off your island into a lawless zone so that that way you could do it. Absolutely. Um, just, uh, you know, uh, conquer other islands. You know, conquer other islands, preferably ones that aren't allied with the government. The Vodka Kingdom is doing that, and it's an amazing success. And and they go on, like, this 10-point PowerPoint thing, and and and, like, none of the points are, like, Hey, maybe you could just lower the heavenly tribute? Uh, so you're kicked out of the reverie. Bye! See, right here, this is what we were talking about. Point number seven. Look for weaker kingdoms, um, like this dude right here, and then just conquer his shit. All right, there you go, right? Yeah, so, yeah, it's a messed up, it's a messed up way, okay? So, uh, Ivankov and Dragon arrive, they free Ginny and Kuma from the prison, obviously Ginny and Kuma recognize uh, the face of Ivankov. By the way, that's something that comes up later during Marineford, when uh, Ivankov is reunited with Kuma there. At that point, Kuma is PX0, and Ivankov says, This is the first time in my life someone has forgotten my face! You know, and so that, that adds a whole new dimension to that as well. Like, oh my god, yeah, I guess you wouldn't forget Ivankov's face, but Kuma did, because he became a robot, right? We get this cool spread of the revolutionaries, or rather the freedom fighters at this point. Uh, we don't see any real familiar faces other than Dragon Ivankov, who were the pillars, and then Kuma joins as the third pillar of the organization. Ginny is also there, like, yeah, let's go, right? Uh, we see uh, the trademark hats. So they all wear these kind of like Oliver Twist kind of top hats. You know, obviously this is Sabo's, but the, the style existed long before Sabo was a member of the Celestial Dragons. Not a member of the Celestial Dragons, a member of the uh, Freedom Fighters, right? So you see some people wearing that. I don't really see Bello Betty or Lindbergh or Morley or anything like that. Actually, I think Morley is still an Impel Down at this point. Morley is the one that actually created the network of tunnels uh, that would become New Kama Land later. So that's, that's an interesting fun fact. Um, but yeah, so Dragon is there. He's got this cool like military outfit on this like double-breasted suit he's got like three stars on his suit don't really know what that signifies if anything he's got that leg band that has the same kind of design as his tattoo that he's later going to tattoo on his face um, this is the same year that he meets Vegapunk at Ohara so obviously he looks exactly the same as he did in that flashback uh, in the next scene dragon kind of talks about the uh, the freedom fighters a little bit and he mentions that we're still in need of funding we still need funding in order to make this happen essentially right now we're just a ragtag band of mercy mercenaries. Um, we're mercenaries that will ally with kingdoms that have corrupt kings to overthrow them. That's basically what the Freedom Fighters are right now. They don't really have, I don't even know if they have Baltigo yet as their home base of operations. Uh, they really are just a band of mercenaries that are fighting for the greater good to overthrow the corrupt world government. That, that is their goal and that is their aim. Uh, we will teach those who wish how to join this military and how to handle weapons and fight. Uh, Kuma mentions, like, how, how do you know all this stuff, Drag? And like, how do you know how to do this kind of stuff, right? We see their ship. Um, the ship, it has a different insignia. It's different from the Revolutionary Army symbol right now that has the dragon on it. This one is just like an X. It's like a big X, and one of the Xs is kind of jagged, like teeth, like maybe dragon teeth. That's the idea. Um, but anyway, dragon mentions, is like, I used to be part of the Marines, but I found no justice there. So I left, and I joined, and I created the Freedom Fighters, right? Uh, Ivankov mentions, ah, yes! Ha ha, hee-haw! You 
first were a Marine fighting for justice, and then you became a revolutionary fighting for the people. You just want to help so many, don't you, Dragon? Right? Now, Dragon is a very serious individual. He's doing what he's doing. That's the correct thing. That's the right thing to get rid of the world government. But he's not like Luffy. He's not like, hey, everybody, let's go fight against the world government. Ah, it should be fun. Dragon, dragon, dragon. You know, I was like, no, no, no. He is a very serious, pragmatic individual. He's like, this is a war we were basically fighting, and it's going to be tough, and a lot of people might die. He, he, he gives me a lot more similarities to Koza, who is the leader of the Revolutionary Army at Alabasta, which, by the way, I feel like Koza should join up with Dragon and the Revolutionaries. I mean, granted, their revolution already happened, and it's all good, you know, everything's... Oh, well, I don't know, actually, now that Alabasta, because Cobra's dead, so that's a whole situation. Actually, I mentioned this earlier, I think the best person to actually rule over Alabasta, since Vivi, and uh, Vivi is with Morgans, and um, uh, Igaram, and Pell, and Chaka are away, probably the smartest person would probably be Koza. He's really good at, you know, like, leading a bunch of people together, like, temporarily even, or even maybe making him the permanent king would probably be fine. So I'm thinking Koza's ruling Alabasta, like, right now as this is happening, right? Okay, so uh, he talks all this stuff like Dragon is speaking about his ideals and everything, and Kuma is like, I will follow you to the ends of the earth, Dragon. I believe in you. And Dragon says, I won't let you regret that decision, Kuma. So that's the kind of leader he is. He's just like, if you join me, I will promise you will not regret it. The kind of work, I will not be corrupted. I will work tirelessly to free all of the citizens from the corrupt world government and the Ten Rubito, and I will never change my ideals on that front. So that's the kind of guy Dragon is. He is unmovable. Very much like how Luffy will never give up on his dream to become King of the Pirates, Dragon will never give up on his dream to liberate the world. Okay, that is something that is steadfast. Okay, that is unmovable. That is Monkey D. Dragon, okay? So now we're cutting again into the future. Eight years in the future, so this is 14 years ago. Kuma would be 32 at this point. Ginny, I think, is 37. Uh, and this is, I think, the same year that Tom creates the, um, the Puffing Tom. The Puffing Tom is finished, finally, uh, at this point as well as Water 7. So we're uh, cutting back to the Sorbet Kingdom very briefly, where Kuma arrives back at his homeland, and he's like, Oh, Kuma, you're back! You should come back and visit more often! We're worried about you! And so we're glad you're doing okay. That's all we get. We have a, ver uh, a vision of Kuma, like in silhouette, arriving at Sorbet. I'm thinking, since Kuma and Ginny went off to join the Revolutionary Army, they probably left Bonnie on their home island in the care of, like, yo, -Yo in the care of, like, their childhood friends to raise her. Okay? And that's why they would eventually become members of Bonnie's crew, because they were essentially her guardians. They protected her, okay? Because, you know, Kuma and Ginny are not going to bring a baby or a little kid onto the Revolutionary Army. Like, that's not gonna happen, all right? They're like, no, you need to stay here, because Sorbet Kingdom is good. Sorbet Kingdom has been liberated. And, and in fact, we still have to factor in Kuma becoming the king at this point, so maybe this is where that happens, but the implication is Kuma comes back every once in a while to say hi to everybody, probably to check up on Bonnie, to provide money and resources and food, but he was also the king. So how is he working on the Revolutionary Army and also being the king unless at this point he comes back and he chooses to stay? Probably is what happened. So while that's going on, in some other random kingdom, probably in the East Blue, we have Ginny, who is now like 37, 38 years old, and she's like, she's got a rifle, and she's a full-fledged member of the Revolutionary Army. In fact, she is the Eastern Army General, meaning that that's the position Bello Betty would get. Bello Betty, I think, would have been 20 years old at this point, so I think Bello Betty might be even, we don't see her in the background anywhere. God, this is so nice. I can actually zoom in. I could zoom! Oh my god! Oda always puts so many things in the background of panels that it's kind of hard for me to see, like, like the old setup, but now I can like, I can like zoom in, that's so freaking awesome. Anyway, they're hanging out, and uh, so yeah, maybe Bello Betty was there. Ginny's just on a big crate of ammo. She's just, she's like freaking Sigourney Weaver or something. She's just like, or like, like uh, Sarah Connor. Or so, actually, I think Sarah Connor is more appropriate there. She's like Linda Hamilton here in T2. She's just like, yeah, we're gonna beat those world government bastards. You know, just like, that's pretty awesome. Uh, ironic, considering she was married to a person that would later become a Terminator. That is, you know, maybe that's the reference, I don't know. Anyway, she's really happy right now, and all the other members of the revolutionaries are like, 
ah, Commander Ginny, why are you so happy right now? And it is like, well, it's because we're gonna go meet up with Kuma's division tomorrow and I'm really excited, okay? And so she's pumped because she hasn't apparently seen Kuma in a while. I'm guessing they're married, but like, you know, because of the revolution, it's just like, hey, Kuma, we need you in the West. Ginny, we need you in the North, okay? We need you in opposite seas. Uh, it's probably something like that, or, or Ginny in the East, because she's the Eastern commander. Kuma might have been in the Southern commander or, or something like that. Maybe, maybe the reason Kuma is returning to Sorbet is because he was just made the Southern Division commander. So like Lindbergh's eventual position. And since Kuma is like, well, if I'm the Southern, Southern General, I might as well live at Sorbet and set myself up as the king while also being a revolutionary. Maybe it was something like that. Well, very last scene of the chapter, everything's going great. And then the last two panels, it's <sighs> Dragon! He gets a call from Baltigo, so they have Baltigo at this point, and Dragon has his tattoo, so he at least had the tattoo 14 years ago. And just like, Dragon, we got bad news! Ginny's been captured! An unexpected enemy has... End of chapter. No break next week. I don't see the break image. So great. No break next week. We're going to get three in a row. Nice. Awesome. Uh, probably a break after the next one. Okay. So, uh, yeah. This, this was a great chapter. I love chapters. I mean, last chapter was great with rocks, but I love chapters that play with the timeline. You know what I mean? That, like 30 years ago, 25 years ago, 22 years ago, 14 years ago, because then I get to pull up the One Piece timeline and like, oh, what was happening 14 years ago? Oh, what was happening 30 years ago? You know, oh, that was when Odin joined Whitebeard's crew. Oh my god, all this stuff's happening at the same time. This is so cool, right? So, um, Everything seemed to be going good. The Sorbet Kingdom was liberated, and they seem to be doing okay. Uh, we get a little bit more of uh, the people that would eventually become Bonnie's crewmates. So, like, Oda is showcasing them a little bit. Not a lot, but enough to understand, like, the kind of people that they are. Uh, and then we get to see Dragon and Ivankov in their younger years, and then Dragon, uh, at some point during 22 years ago and 14 years ago, because they have Ball to go at this point, something happened where they received funding. Not sure where the funding came from, but it's always possible that the funding might have actually come from Vegapunk. Because, you know, Dragon asked Vegapunk at O'Hara, like, join the Freedom Fighters. I can't believe you sided with the government. And Vegapunk's like, well, that's where they, they have the money for my research, Quasar. That's what I'm doing. What if, after Vegapunk joined the government and got his research funding, what if he took some of that funding and funneled it into the revolution? secretly, because he would have been able to do it. Uh, I don't know if they like bank accounts in the One Piece world or whatever, but you know, like he, he's Vegapunk. He could figure out a way to do it. And uh, maybe that's the reason why Vegapunk doesn't have as much money as he wanted. Not because they're not giving him enough, but because he has to take some of it and give it to the revolution. Because at this point, they have a home base. They have Ball to Go. Dragon has the tattoo. That couldn't have been cheap to make the tattoo. You know what I mean? They have a lot more resources. They have a lot more people. They have actual armies at this point, because Ginny is the Eastern Army captain, meaning that, you know, the generals exist at this point. So there's an Eastern, Western, Northern, Southern, and Grand Line captains and generals uh, and vice generals and everything like that. So the Revolutionary Army 14 years ago seemed to have the same structure as it does right now. So they either have the benefactor of Vegapunk or somebody else that was funding their operation or they received money somewhere else in order to make this work. Because Dragon specifically mentioned in this chapter, we lack funding, we need to find it, okay? Maybe they found Captain John's treasure. Maybe they were the ones that found it. Who knows? Well, anyway, um, that was the chapter. Really solid one. A lot of stuff to unpack with this one. Still stuff to unpack from the last chapter. I'm going to do a video actually on Gloriosa. Uh, uh, Granny Neon becoming, you know, a member of Roxas crew and that she was the former empress. Definitely got to do one about that. Got to do one talking about uh, Kuma and maybe like maybe I can even do an expanded video on the pawpaw fruit since we know a little bit more about that now. Um, maybe Bonnie's crew and stuff, uh, Bonnie herself. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff to unpack here. Thanks for watching everybody. This will be Teching 101 signing out. Later all.